Okay, if everything is fine, I think I can start. So, okay, good afternoon. My name is Manuele. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, in a joint collaboration between uh, the Stazione Geologica from Napoli and the Laboratory of uh, Interdisciplinary Physics in Padova. Uh, so, the title of this, this school is uh, From Single Cells to Cell Communities. And today I will discuss about uh, some taxonomic and uh, functional uh, patterns in diatoms, uh, basically following the opposite path. So I will start from uh, cell, cell communities, and in particular I will rely on uh, the Tara Ocean dataset, which uh, Martina already mentioned last week. And for the ones of you who are not familiar, so the Tara Ocean is a... Um, it's an expedition that have collected samples all across the, all across the oceans and for a, a large uh, range of, um, of dimension of individuals, mainly on planktons. And basically, thanks to high throughput sequencing, they have produced uh, um, a three, uh, three data sets of uh, uh, metaomics, which are the metabarcoding, which will be the focus on uh, the first part of the talk, and then the metagenomics and metatranscriptomics, which will be the focus on the second part of the talk. So thanks to this, uh, uh, let's say, very uh, big data set, we can ask questions like, uh, so despite the very biogeochemical heterogeneity of this data set, can we observe some common rules that uh, regulate somehow the taxonomic composition and also the functional expression of uh, our communities. Um, okay. And yeah, so we focus on diatoms mainly for two reasons. The first one is because they are important. So they are a class of phytoplankton, so they, they play a key role in the carbon cycle, and also they are uh, huge in terms of biomass. But the, the main reason here is that they are ocean wide distributed. And so if we want to infer some properties of uh, all the of, of all the latitudes, for instance, all the temperatures, we, we need some uh, species that uh, are everywhere, okay? And despite that, they, they, of course, they adapt to different conditions, they somehow occupy similar trophic levels. So this makes them as a ideal candidates for uh, investigate uh, uh, global patterns, let's say. Okay, so be before getting into the, really into the topics, um, a descriptor that will be the, 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 the most important during this talk will be the species abundant distribution, which uh, is, a, distrib which is a, a descriptor that is very used in, the, in ecology. Um, basically, so here I, I show you a tropical forest just for historical reason. Let's see that, let, let's, let's suppose that you have a, a sample from your forest. Um, a possible way to study it as a, as a community, as a wall, is to uh, classify the species that you observe in classes of abundances, and usually in, in logs two scales. So for instance, here we can, I don't know why, it's not working, yes. Uh, we can divide uh, uh, in log two scales, in log two, log two scale abundances from one to two, from two to four, to, from four to eight, and, and so on. And we can count how many species uh, have a particular abundance. And as you can see, here we have a lot of species which are rare, so with just a few individuals, and, and just a few species that have a, lot of, have a lot of individuals. And properties like this are shared uh, within a lot of communities, a lot of, despite the, 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 uh, a lot of differences that you can find in nature. Um, so these somehow uh, shared, shared features suggest that exist some uh, um, some very fundamental and, and also simple mechanism that is shared across the communities and somehow regulate this distribution. Um, this is a question that has puzzled the, the ecologists for, uh, for uh, several years, and a possible uh, explanation was done by the so-called neutral theory of ecology, in which by uh, assuming that the species basically do not interact and they basically they just uh, obey some very fundamental mechanisms such as birth, death, and migration, we can describe, oops, we can describe the, the, the properties that we observe in, in nature. And this is just not, uh, let's say, uh, 
fitting. This is, just, this is also interpreting what we observe. Because for instance, here we can say that the, in a sense the interaction are, uh, are weak, so are negligible. Okay, so in the first part I will talk about some taxonomic, uh, taxonomic results. So I will focus on the metabar coding in Tara. A first work uh, that focus on the species abundant distribution is a work by Enrico Sergiacomi, in which basically they analyze different uh, sizes of planktons from the pico to the mesoscale, and they found that the distribution is very similar all across the ocean. So despite the, differ the differences that you can have in the polar regions and the tropical ones, the distribution, the species abundant distribution, is very similar. And they propose a model, which is in the, in the spirit of the neutral theory, so just, you just have a, a birth and death terms and an immigration and migration term, and you can derive uh, the species abundant distribution, your theoretical species abundant distribution, which is simple, a power law with an exponential cutoff. So we, we started by testing if uh, focusing only on diatoms, we observe similar patterns, uh, and the, the answer is yes. So in this plot here, I'm representing the species abundant distribution of all the, of all the communities collected by, by Tara. Um, and I put also a power law reference with the same exponent that Sir Giacomo found. And as you can see, we can, we can observe clearly that there are differences depending to the different temperatures with the most abundant uh, um, stations that are uh, uh, the, the coldest ones, or the, the polar ones. But this, despite this uh, diversion in the total abundance, the power law is more or less the same all across the, the data set. And then you can perform maximum likelihood power law fits, and you find that basically the, the medium of the, of the power law is exactly in agreement with uh, uh, with the, the one by uh, Enrico. And so we, we proposed uh, um, we propose a, a, sampling, a sampling hypothesis because we, the idea that we have is, somehow, is, is that somehow the, diverge, the, the diversity that we've observed is mainly due ju just to different sampling efforts in, the, in, our, um, in our data sets. So in a sense, we should expect that the only Diversity that we observe is just the, the total number, the total, uh, the total number of OTUs. So we started from a, a very abundant station, one of the polar ones, and we started to sample from it. Okay. And in this way, we can produce synthetic samples, synthetic SATs, just by, um, just by matching the number of, sa of sample OTUs with the observed ones. Okay. And as you can see, this very simple exercise produces quite good results. And we, then we can test these results by comparing the richness, so the total number of uh, uh, OTUs that we observe, and the agreement is quite high. Although you can observe that there are non, not, um, not random deviations, since we are usually overestimating the richness in the most abundant, and we are underestimating the richness in the less abundant. So we propose a theoretical model in which basically um, the idea is very simple. It's, the idea is just that uh, on, in the polar regions, so in the most uh, abundant stations, uh, the sampling effort is better than the one we have uh, on the other regions. And so we assume that dynamics is the, is the same everywhere with the same rates, but what we observe is different from the reality because we have uh, an impact on the less abundant station due to the different sampling effort. And we can quantify it, yes. Can I um, with sampling, sampling effort, do you mean that you get more reads in general? Yes. OK. Yeah, is it? But is it because in also there is more biomass at the poles? Exactly, yes. OK. Yes. And it was just to understand. Yes. Yes, and we, and we um, we use the, the, um, the ratio between the total abundances as a proxy of the, the ratio of the sampling efforts. Thanks. So that's uh, the idea. Okay, and so we can fit, as uh, Sir Giacomo did, the, the species abundant distribution of one of the reference stations, and then we can make a prediction of the SAD of the other station 
just using the fitted parameters and the ratio of the total abundances as a, a proxy of the ratio of the sampling efforts. And the results are pretty good, I will say. And then we can also, as before, infer the number of uh, different species. And again, we observe a, a good correlation. So the prediction is good, but again, the deviation are not random. So they follow uh, a biogeography, let's say. Okay, so, and, and for us, this means the following. So at the first level, we, we can say that the subcommunity of a, a, very, a very specific condition, so in the Arctic, which is large, but not the large. So it, it has more or less the 7% of the total richness. So starting from the properties of one station, we can infer properties anywhere in the ocean. But this is not all, this is not the whole story. So at the same time, the deviations reveal that somehow we should take in consideration also other ingredients, other, uh, yes, other ingredients. So in other words, the idea is that the, the SAD of the other station is a, a function of the sampling effort, which uh, explain somehow the, 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 the mean properties, but then the deviations are a function of the environment. And okay, and then we, we can also argue what are the ingredients that we should consider, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and in particular, uh, we find that the, the deviation, so this delta S, is highly correlated with the, the um, geographical properties. So latitude, temperature, salinity, while it's not correlated, for instance, with the nutrients. And this sh should be understood, yes. Sorry, but did you try to disentangle whether it's uh, temperature or latitude? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, so um, we, I, I don't know why it's, it's not here the plot, but we uh, use random forest to try to understand which uh, were the most important ingredients, and usually is, uh, is temperature. Um, the, the, the strange thing is that uh, when we look at the, uh, at the highest um, uh, correlations, the, actually the, the, the highest one is not with one, um, is not one with one of these properties, with, but is one of with, uh, with the evenness, uh, which, is a, uh, which is a measure of the Shannon entropy. So it's something which is not related to temperature salinity. So in other words, uh, it is somehow strange because mm -hmm. we were, we, yeah, but it's yeah. sort of, okay, sorry, go ahead. But. No, yeah, we were sort of like puzzled because we were expecting that the deviation um, showed the, the high correlation, the highest correlation with the, the, for instance, the temperature. So it is somehow strange that the, the, correl the highest correlation is with an intrinsic property of the station. But they are uh, sort of correlated because the evenness, it's like a, a measure of how broad is the distribution. Yeah. And if you think that sampling uh, is uh, sort of uh, at the origin of, uh, of the trend in diversity, you should expect. It. I mean, actually, evenness is quite insensitive to, to sampling. So by measuring evenness, you are sort of measuring the true contribution of diversity, which is what you also measure by looking at the deviation of diversity respect yes. to sampling. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. The point is that, uh, yes, but we, we were like, uh, so we were expecting the evenness to be correlated with the, the power law exponent. So let's say naively one should expect that uh, you should observe different evenness if you have different slopes of the power law, which was not the case. And I don't know if you get my point. No, I, okay. Okay, yeah, but yeah, so th there is something that we should un understand, but let's say that, as I said before, the average uh, diversity can be uh, un understood just by a sampling hypothesis, and then we, uh, we should investigate to this deviation. This is more or less the take home message for this part. Then let's move to, this, to the second part in which um, I will I will focus more on the, the functional level, so 
on the gene expression level. Um, so basically, when we, we started to analyze the, the metatranscriptomic data, we started to read some, the, the literature, and the species abundant distribution is something that uh, has already been uh, studied uh, in the context of gene expression. But the, the idea, the, the underlying idea that we found was that the gene expression were, all, were always uh, um, basically uh, power law distributed, and the exponents were found to be similar uh, all across uh, several species, so from the bacteria to humans. Okay, so this was what we found in literature. Uh, but as you can see, there was something that was puzzling us that uh, somehow we, we can already here see some deviation from this power law. So we started as an exercise to, to look at the species abundant distribution. And if you perform a maximum likelihood fit with a power, with a simple power law, you will find um, weird results in the sense that you can see that for the less abundant genes, the power law works pretty well. But as soon as you consider the most abundant genes, uh, you have clear deviation from it. And this is something that you can observe both at, for meta G and meta T. With, okay. Um, Yes. Can you make this to say exactly what the plot is? Yes. So, yes, exactly. I want to. So, the, the, the left plot here is the species abundant distribution. So, the, basically, here I consider uh, a Tara station. Um, I look at how many genes uh, I have in the metagenomics or in metatranscriptomics. Is that the difference of the genes? Um, so, Basically, in which sense? We, uh, so, what do you mean? What? What? Uh, how do they build the, the data sets? Or yes, yes, they have uh, some. Re yes, they have so some reference. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, how do they cluster it? So I, I think they use some uh, reference uh, uh, genome for some of the species of diatoms because we, they are known. But uh, I'm, I think that mainly they use clustering algorithms because many of the diatoms that, we, that they find in the ocean are not yet classified. So I think it's something like a clustering algorithm. And OK. Uh, so once you have defined what, what the gene is, you can count them. So you have a row, row counts of uh, several genes. And then you can uh, count how many, gene, uh, how many copies of a particular gene you find in your, uh, in your station. Is this a proxy for how many species can you register? Uh, the metagenomics, yes, because it's, it's the, the gene contents in the DNA. While the metatranscriptomic, no, because it's uh, the, the number of expressive genes, which is a function of both of uh, the genes that are present in the DNA, but also on the, on the function that are expressed. And, and so in this way, you can make the, the left plot, while the, the right plot is the, the so-called rank abundance distribution, which is uh, basically another way to look at the same properties. Uh, because basically you, you consider your genes, you sort them from the most abundant to the less abundant, and then you, you make a scatter plot like this, which is related to the, uh, to the cumulative distribution of the left plot. So it's just, uh, there are just two, two different ways to look at the same properties. Okay, is it clear now? Okay, so. The first thing that one can do, of course, is to try to, to, fit, if, to fit the most abundant genes. So we perform another maximum likelihood for the most abundant. And somehow, to us, it, it, it seems that there are two regimes, each one following a different power law with different slopes. And also, if you look at the all SAS for all the stations, 
you can clear, if you compare them with the meta barcoding that I showed you before, you can clearly see that the meta transcriptomics in particular follow something different than just a simple power law. Okay, so the question is basically why? Why do we observe these two slopes? Uh, what, what is the meaning of these two, two slopes? And <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing that we tried was to, uh, to um, perform likelihood ratio tests among a quite broad class of distributions. And then eventually we found that in more than 90% of the cases, the, the selected distribution was this generalization of the power law, um, which has this formula here, but which is not nothing else that, uh, uh, let's say, a double power law. So here you have that you have uh, a scale K, I'm sorry. That I... You can see that the, the, this function, you have the argument that is always X minus mu, mu is just the minimum value, K is a scale, and then you have uh, some exponents. And when X is small, when X is small, basically this factor is one, and you have a simple power law, which this is this term here, while when X, X is large, you have the multiplication of two power laws, and again, is a, is a power law, okay? So we started to test on the different stations, and it works pretty well. That basically, no, I, I mean that basically, uh, a, a, um, among several uh, distribution, this is the only one that is able to, to fit this, uh, uh, this data across several order of magnitude. So the rank abundance, uh, for instance, is here spans five order of magnitudes. And to us was like surprising that in a, in a data set like the, the one from Tara, which is uh, usually full of noise, you can have a single function that describe uh, five order of magnitudes of abundances of gene expressed in a meta in a meta transcription so in a collection of uh, of individuals in this sense I mean. yeah. uh, but regard, regarding your question we analyzed also of course the, uh, the the two exponents of the the two power laws and basically what we found was that in the meta transcriptomics we can clearly we can clearly see uh, a dependence of the uh, of the uh, basically of the latitude so if you look that at the of the polar regions the exponents are lower when compared to the to the one of the more tropical areas while this does not occur at, at, um, as clearly in the metagenomics. And so in other words, if you, if, you make a, if you look at the correlation among the distribution parameters and the environmental parameters, you will find that the K, which is a proxy of the mean uh, abundances of the genes, correlates with the environment, while this not, does not occur on the metatranscriptomics. And on the other hand, the the parameter, so the slope of the distribution, um, is correlated for the metatranscriptomics. So the function, are some, uh, the slope of the function is correlated with the environment, while this is not the case uh, for the metagenomics. And yes, and then you can uh, also do a random forest, but okay. So the 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 most imp the, the most puzzling question for us is. Why do we observe this uh, distribution? Or at least, why do we observe two power law regimes? Um, the first thing that one can think is that since we are observing a meta community, the double slopes uh, are just uh, the result of uh, dealing with, uh, with such a complex systems and not with the single cells. But eventually we uh, analyzed more than 300 samples of single cells data, and we found that uh, these double slopes uh, uh, it's like everywhere. Okay, so this, uh, so we look at um, not on just on diatoms, but also on other uh, on other species, and we consistently 
found that a simple power law is not the, the law that describes the, the data. Okay, so our intuition is that the mechanism that uh, shapes this distribution is something that uh, is already present at the single cell level, and not, it's not just a result of the community level. Uh, th these are just, uh, uh, they are always uh, gene expressions. Okay. I have to know that that can be very well fit with a, with a log normal. Uh, we, f uh, we try with the log normal, but um, the, the Pareto law is always the one that was selected. Uh, in, uh, well, in you have two more parameters. Yes, we also uh, did the BIC, which uh, accounts for parameters, and the Pareto was the one selected. But yes, in a sense, I agree. So the, the, for us, the important point here is that we observe two slopes, not the Pareto. I, we, don't, we don't believe that the Pareto law is uh, somehow a golden rule of the gene expression. The important point for us is that we observe two slopes, and we want to account for these two slopes, in a sense. Yes, but the, the, yes, I agree. But uh, the log normal is not able to describe uh, the, the tails that we observe. So we have particular problems on the tails of the distribution. Okay, and just a, a quick comment. So if, for instance, if, if for, a one, for a moment we trust to this distribution and we compare uh, different experiments for the, the, the same, uh, uh, within the, the so we, we compare different conditions within the, the same uh, experiment, um, we find that the, the, the um, exponent um, are, uh, <clears throat> I mean, are clustered according to different conditions. So for instance here, the blue points represent the control, and you, for instance, you can argue that uh, the influence that you have when, you, uh, when, when the stress is heat, uh, is uh, somehow can, can, can be seen at the community level, while, for instance, uh, the cold condition are not a good, are not uh, as stressful as the, the heat ones. So you can also make some inference about the, uh, how the how does the community level, uh, sorry, how does the, the uh, whole uh, genomic level you respond to different stress? Yes. Can you reconstruct from the Tara data the gene expression of single species of the diatoms or not? Uh, I, um, I think that you can do, but just for a very limited number. So I don't think it's, uh, you can make something statistical. No, no, just because here you have single species, but I was wondering if you can do single species in your data. I'm not aware of anyone that are, already, that are that's, I mean. So if you can, if, if you do it for each, so if mm -hmm. you have a diatom species uh, within I, I think in principle it's possible, but uh, I think that known species are less than 1% of the, uh, the one that we are studying. So okay. yeah, but it's something that we can try. Okay, so at, at the end we, we would like to, to propose, a, let's say a minimal model to understand if it's possible to explain these two, these two slopes. And we started from the, the, the central dogma. So as you know, you, um, I mean, as you know, here you, have in, you can have a promoter that are inactive and inactive, and they can uh, jump from one state to the other. And then when the promoter is active with a certain rate, we can have uh, the transcription of mRNA, which in turn can uh, either degradate or uh, be translated to, to proteins. And yeah, but as, um, as you might know, um, usually people uh, focus on the distribution of protein in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this scenario. And the distribution is a negative binomial, which is uh, uh, in, the, in the continuum limit is a gamma distribution, which is something that uh, is not what we observe. 
And also, uh, the, the mRNA is a Poisson distributed. So it's, again, something that we do not observe in our data. So in the literature, we found that uh, in a paper from 2006, uh, they proposed a, uh, a slightly more complex model in which they add two ingredients. The first one is a feedback, a hills like feedback, so, uh, which is basically uh, a monofunction and a leakage term in which uh, you can have the transcription of RNA also when you are in the inactive promoter state. And within this, within this um, model, you can derive a, a species abundant distribution for the proteins, which uh, has this structure, which is a, a double power law with an exponential cutoff. So here the, we have two main problems. The first one is that this distribution is for uh, proteins, not for, uh, for genes. But this can be translated in the language of uh, uh, mRNA if you consider that the, the mRNA is not already transcri transcribed as uh, mature, but it has uh, to be that it's first uh, transcribed in the nascent state and then it becomes mature. Um, the second, the second, um, so the, the second point here is that if you want to uh, to match the distribution that you find with the, the Pareto one, you have to impose some. Uh, you have to impose that the, your uh, uh, hills like feedback can assume negative values, which is something uh, weird. So we are still investigating it. But in, something that I, I really like is that uh, um, if you are able to to match uh, the, this model with the, the distribution. You can ha you can have a biological interpretation of your parameters that you the, that, you, that you fit. So, for instance, in the model, you can define an activity as the mean number of births per, per cycle in the, in the protein expressions. And when you match the distribution with the, the Pareto law, you you have this simple this simple relation between the activity and the and the Pareto slopes. And for instance, we look at, the, at one experiment in which they stressed a species of diatom by, um, by having three months of uh, prolonged darkness. And what they say is in, the, in, in this experiment is that diatom cells, after some, some days, um, have a, a reduction in the metabolic and transcriptomonal activity. Sorry. And this is something that we observe also when we look at the activity as measured by the Pareto exponent. So you can have an interpretation. <clears throat> OK, uh, let, let me just conclude with this, uh, uh, with this part by, uh, so last week, uh, uh, Andrea Weisse um, talked about the, the, about the mechanistic single cell model in which uh, using some uh, trade-offs, you can derive 14 ODEs that rule the that rule the important stuff inside the, the cell cycles. Um, if you focus on the free mRNA, which is, which is uh, what we measure, you will, in their equation, you will observe that basically you have some positive uh, contributions which uh, do not depend on the, the, the current state. So it does not depend, they do, they do not depend on M and some negative con uh, contribution, which are linear on M. So basically, what we tried was to start with a, a very minimal model, a very uh, minimal effective model, in which we call mu all the positive uh, uh, components, so we call, we call it transcription, and then we put a def terms, which is linear with X, where X is the, the mRNA concentration. But of course, we should consider that we have other variables that vary you know, during times. So since this will be a very minimal and effective model, we put two, uh, two sources of noise. And so we, we have this uh, Fokker-Planck equation, which can be integrated. And eventually, we'll, you will find a double, a double power law uh, behavior in which you have uh, four relevant parameters. One is the, the death rate, so uh, you know the, what is the average lifetime of mRNA. And then you have K, which is the ratio of the two noise, 
of the two noises, which is the scale, and then you have two uh, parameters, alpha and beta, that reg regulates the slopes. So you can do some simulations. For, for instance, here I have a zoom of, on the mRNA um, uh, production on 10 minutes, if I remember correctly. And then you can look at the species abundant distribution and the rank abundant distribution, and they have this power, double power law behavior. And then you can try to fit it to the Tara Ocean data. And yes, so I, I, don't, I don't think that Pareto is the, the golden law, but again, you need to have uh, uh, some mechanism that have these this, uh, features to have two power, power slow. Uh, yes, so since I'm late, I think I'll keep the take home message. Uh, let me just thank my collaborators and have a good lunch. We still have some time for questions. Can you, all right, so in the model, I'm just trying to wrap my hand around the model. What is causing some genes to be much higher expressed than other genes, right? So there is like four or five orders of magnitude difference in mRNA levels of different, of different genes. Mm -hmm. So in the model, why is a high expressed gene high and a low expressed gene low? What, what's the sort of mechanistic origin in your yeah. model? So the intuition is that you have two sources of uh, uh, noise. One is so it's all noise. That's just all a result of noise. I mean, the, the intuition is that uh, you have, yes, you have two noises, and one is dominant on one scale, and the other is dominant on the other scale. Yes, but you. you I mean, but yes. we know that this is regulated, right? Ribosomes are always high expressed in any organism, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say things like transcription factors are always low expressed, right? Yes. In any, you, could, you could take mRNA from any animal you want and you correlate the autologous genes against each mm -hmm. other, you get 0.8 correlation coefficient, right? This is not random. This is being designed yes, by evolution, but right? Stochastic means, means not random. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I got your question, but I, I, don't, I don't see that these are two opposite uh, ways of looking at the same properties. I mean, we know that the stochasticity uh, plays a role. I'm not saying that here I just throw a dice, no? I, I'm just saying that uh, they have two scales, and in, in each scale, I have a, a, a source of noise, which is something that we know. And depending on which scale I, I have, the slope is different. I'm not saying anything more than that. So if, yeah. But let's say actin will always be on the right of your distribution, no matter what kind of system you look yeah. at. In all eukaryotic cells, actin is one of the highest expressed genes. Yeah. It's just always the case. So yeah. And I, I, I just, understand it. You're saying, well, that's the result of noise. That seems to me strange. No, no I, I will say something else. I will say that this is just a, another perspective. So usually you will focus on something that you know, just on acting, for instance. But here, the idea is, just, is that uh, also at the, at the wall uh, expression level, you have like a reorganization of your distribution. So in a sense, when you, when you for instance, you, you change conditions, it's true that you are, uh, in a sense, uh, affecting some particular genes, some particular transcriptions, but this is not all. I mean, you are also, in a, in a sense, reorganizing the whole distribution. Uh, and this has, is related not just to one class of, of genes, but to the whole gene. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the talk. I was, um, it's really good to see the, the neutral modeling um, being thrown at the Terra data. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about like, the, all the analysis that's been made with uh, the Terra data, but from what you said, um, basically, if you would 
sample equal biomass at each of the stations, mm -hmm. you will get the same number of species. So yeah, um, they, I, we wanted to test this, and the answer is uh, uh, yes, but the, with some deviations, and the deviations is uh, somehow related to the different conditions. Yeah, I think that that's that, very that's, yeah that's um, that's very cool. So I'm looking forward to the to the thanks. paper. I think that's it's going to be very interesting, and I feel like especially the community that started the project. It's not necessarily the community that thinks a lot about neutral models and, and the sampling things. So I think that, you, that you're doing this is, is very cool. Thanks. Hi, I was wondering if you could just uh, help me clarify one of the points that I think you tried to make. You looked at a meta transcriptome and you fit this Pareto distribution to the entire community, mm -hmm. and then you uh, looked at individual species as well, and you found that they also followed this Pareto distribution with, yep. with similar types of parameters and yep. such. Yeah. So, so I, that, that's really interesting. Um, it suggests that interactions among individuals in, in the ocean might not fundamentally change this distribution of, of uh, transcript activity yep. and distribution. Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm still trying to think about what that means biologically and what we could use with uh, how, how to interpret that, that that pattern. I was wondering if you could just um, yeah. maybe elaborate a little bit on uh, that yeah. some more, so I I, I can understand. Uh, yeah, maybe other. Yes, yeah, I mean, so basically, I'm here to <laughs> to understand more this this question. So um, I will say that in a sense. Uh, uh, this observation makes, makes me think that uh, interactions uh, are not the, the right ingredients that shape the distribution. So uh, this is somehow an indication of ne neutrality at the community level, but I, w I will not say something more than this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, I mean, it's. If you have an interpretation, I would say. No, I mean, I, I've thought about this myself, because we, we've looked at distributions of metabolic activity in isolates, um, not, not, not gene uh -huh. expression per se, but just looking at, and then we've gone into environmental communities and the distributions of activity for individual populations and in communities look different, like qualitatively different um, models need to be used to fit those data. And that's made me wonder, well, what goes on? What, what can we learn from, from isolates or individual populations? And then when we go into mixed communities, that for, for our data, it seems like there's something different. And in your data, it seems like the distributions for isolates or single populations and whole communities are the same. And so for me personally, I, I, with that, that comparison now that uh -huh. I'm trying to reconcile what that means for your data and my data and yeah. I mean, they're different yeah. sorts of information, but it's the same general principle that we're looking at distributions of activity uh, in single populations and mixed communities. Uh -huh. now, okay, we also found some differences, but not on the uh, on the function. So maybe, for instance, on, on the Tara data sets, the, the range of exponents is larger than the one that we observe in the single cells. But so there are some differences. They are not completely the same, but at least the, the distribution is uh, functionally similar, yeah. So, thanks. All right, uh, in the interest of you all getting lunch, <laughs> we will unfortunately have to question it here. I was told that we continue at 2.30 and Wolf still wants to say something before we can thank the speaker again. Um, so it's just a short announcement uh, related to the book chapter writing. So I think uh, most of you know what I'm talking about, those who just arrived today. We have um, sessions um, like almost every day for 